Welcome to those of you joining us virtually via Zoom or on the phone. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to be here. Uh, we've worked to accommodate virtual participation and to provide meaningful, meaningful interpretation tonight. For those of us just joining us, if you're having any trouble, um, we, I will reiterate that you can please reach out to info, I-N-F-O, at pfoscommunityengagement.org for tech support. I'll hand it over to Grace. Hello, everyone. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's virtual community engagement session, we'd like to take a few minutes to review the webinar platform. First, a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded. All attendees are muted and in listen-only mode until the feedback portion of this session. During the second half of the session, we will open it up for feedback from individuals who have signed up to speak. We'll first hear from those uh, who signed up to share verbal feedback ahead of time, and then there will be an opportunity for others to share comments. We'll share specific instructions on how to give feedback using your device mic during that portion of the session. Next slide. And here is a quick overview of Zoom controls. You can adjust your audio and mic settings in the lower left corner of the Zoom navigation bar. You'll use the raise hand function if we have time at the end of the session for additional public feedback. Click show captions to turn on English closed captioning, and you can select what language you want your audio in using the interpretation button. Next slide. There is an English and Spanish audio stream available for this session. To access the translated stream, you must listen via online audio in Zoom, not via the call in number. Click the interpretation icon in the navigation bar in the lower part of the Zoom window to access your translation options. Select your preferred language, either English or Spanish. If you are listening in Spanish, it is recommended to mute original audio. This option is also located in the translation button. And next slide. And again, if you require uh, technical assistance with the Zoom platform, please email info at pfastcommunityengagement.org and we can help you. Next slide. And finally, before we begin, I want to highlight that by participating in today's online event, you acknowledge and consent that your name, video, image, or phone number may be visible to others in the live online meeting, as well as captured in the recording. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks again for joining us this evening. Um, as you know, tonight we're going to be focusing on a class of chemicals known as PFAS. We plan to both describe some work the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is doing on these chemicals and then hear directly from many of you. Um, before we begin, I wanted to share a bit about myself, your moderator for today's session. Uh, my name is Kirsten Safakis, and I work for EPA Region 5, the Midwest region. It's my responsibility to keep our session organized and moving along this evening. Um, I'm here because it's my job as a community involvement coordinator with the region to engage with and listen to residents of the Midwest, such as yourself. I've worked on environmental cleanup sites across our six states and actually am currently deployed to an environmental fire in, in Indiana. So if you heard laughter earlier, I apologize. Those were my coworkers in the incident command post. Um, I take my duty as your liaison to the agency and even more importantly, your advocate very seriously. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Next slide, agenda, wonderful. I'd like to share uh, with you our basic plan for the evening. Um, right now, as you can tell, we're starting with housekeeping and instructions. Next, we will hear a few words from EPA's regional administrator, Deborah Shore. We will then turn to a member of EPA's PFAS Council, Rod Schneider. And finally, we'll hear a bit from my colleague, Kim Harris, who will share more about PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, and EPA's work under the strategic roadmap. 
Following these remarks, we are looking forward to hearing from many of you during the listening session portion of today's event. We'll share more details about how you can participate in the listening session when we get to that portion of tonight's agenda. But next, I'd like to introduce Deborah Shore, EPA's Regional Administrator for EPA Region 5. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Deborah Shore, and I'm the Regional Administrator for EPA's Great Lakes Region. As Region 5 Administrator, I lead more than 1,000 EPA scientists, engineers, and program staff in their efforts to protect human health and the environment across our six state region. You see the map, including Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, as well as 35 tribal nations. Prior to my appointment, I served as a commissioner on the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago for nearly 15 years. This listening session is focused on a group of chemicals called PFAS. We're going to spend some time sharing what we're doing at EPA to address these chemicals. But most importantly, we want to hear from all of you. PFAS are widely used, long lasting chemicals, often called forever chemicals because they don't break down over time. There are thousands of different PFAS. Studies show that certain PFAS can have serious public health and environmental impacts. And we continue to learn more about their effects on human health and the environment. I wanna acknowledge at the outset that the topic we're discussing today can be challenging, partly because the issue we're here to talk about can be complex. And also because many of you are likely here because PFAS have already affected you, your family, or your community, or because you're concerned that PFAS may affect you in the future. EPA is working to address these chemicals using our PFAS strategic roadmap, our plan to research, restrict, and remediate them. Here in the region, we've issued enforcement orders against several major PFAS manufacturers. We have collaborated on research that was used to reduce PFAS releases by more than 90% in chrome plating facilities. We're conducting voluntary drinking water sampling for public water systems on tribal lands. We're monitoring PFAS in fish, sediment, atmospheric deposition, and water to understand status and trends in the Great Lakes. And we're providing emergency response support and supporting state-led site investigations. I'd like to highlight that our region five states have been recognized nationally for their leadership role in addressing PFAS. All have initiated or completed statewide PFAS sampling at drinking water systems, and many have developed state PFAS limits. They've investigated PFAS releases from industrial dischargers, monitored for PFAS in wastewater, biosolids, air deposition, and natural resources, regulated the use of PFAS containing firefighting foams, issued enforcement actions against polluters, and conducted cutting edge research on treatment technologies. A number of the tribal nations have also taken a leadership role on PFAS through such actions as PFAS monitoring of water bodies and launching their own PFAS action plans. Those are just a few of the things happening in region five that are gonna help us understand and address PFAS in years to come. One of the themes you'll hear today is the importance of working across EPA and with our partners in other federal agencies, in tribal nations, states, and the public to tackle the challenge that PFAS contamination poses. The core group at EPA working on this is our EPA Council on PFAS or PFAS Council. 
In a few moments, I'll be turning to my colleague, Rod Snyder, who's a member of EPA's PFAS Council to share some opening thoughts with us. The feedback you provide today will help us better understand what you, your family, and your community are experiencing in order to keep us focused on protecting human health and the environment and addressing PFAS contamination. And your feedback will help us better communicate about the risks of PFAS, including information about what PFAS are, how they're used, and how they can affect our health. You'll hear from my EPA colleagues about the actions EPA has taken and plans to take. And we welcome your feedback on these actions or on additional actions you'd like us to consider. As I've said, we're doing this work in close coordination with our federal, state, tribal, and local partners. So we welcome feedback on the ways we can work more effectively with these partners. And with that, I'll turn it to Rod Snyder. Over to you, Rod. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, as Deborah mentioned, my name is Rod Snyder. My job at EPA is to serve as Senior Advisor for Agriculture to EPA Administrator Michael Regan in the headquarters in Washington, D.C. In this role, I help facilitate effective communication between EPA and agriculture stakeholders about priority environmental issues. But in addition to that responsibility in my job, and the reason I'm here with you this evening is that I also serve on the group that Deborah mentioned, which is known as EPA's PFAS Council. As Deborah mentioned a few minutes ago, addressing PFAS issues is a top priority for EPA and for Administrator Regan. And as you'll learn more in a moment, one of Administrator Regan's first actions when he joined EPA in 2021 was to create the EPA's PFAS Council. In creating the Council, Administrator Regan asked us to develop an ambitious plan of action to advance science and research, to restrict these dangerous chemicals from getting into the environment, and to remediate the problem in communities across the country. The plan we developed is known as the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, our whole of government, whole of, excuse me, whole of agency approach to addressing PFAS. You'll hear more about the roadmap in just a few minutes. The roadmap sets timelines by which EPA plans to take specific actions across each of our major program areas. And in addition to these program specific priority actions, we also included a set of actions that cut across our, our specific program areas. And one of these critical areas is engaging directly with communities. One of the key reasons we are holding this session this evening is due to a recommendation from EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council that we engage with communities in each EPA region. In my job in DC, I'm committed and passionate about moving EPA's work forward on PFAS. But tonight, it's just as important that I join you all here in Region 5 so that I can have the opportunity to hear firsthand about your experiences with PFAS contamination. By listening to all of you, I can have a better sense of how to have the greatest impact throughout our work. So thank you all for being here today. And I look forward to hearing from many of you during our listening session later this evening. Now I'd like to turn it over to Region 5's lead point of contact on PFAS, Kim Harris, to spend some time walking through EPA's PFAS strategic roadmap, and then setting the stage for our listening session. Thank you, Rod, and good evening, everyone. As Rod indicated, I'm Kim Harris, and I work in EPA Region 5 as our PFAS advisor. In this role, I lead a team that provides support to states, tribes, and communities on PFAS activities, including research, sampling, enforcement, laboratory method development, and site investigations. An additional responsibility of mine is to serve as our point of contact for Region 5 on PFAS issues and to work closely with the PFAS Council to ensure we're coordinating effectively on PFAS. Tonight, I'll share some information about the work EPA has done under the PFAS strategic roadmap, highlight actions we're planning for the future, and listen as you all share your experiences with PFAS 
to inform work in Region 5 and actions and, 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 and to inform us across the country. Next slide. As Rod shared earlier in April of 2021, EPA Administrator Michael Regan established the EPA Council on PFAS and charged it to develop a bold strategic whole of EPA approach to protect public health and the environment from the impacts of PFAS. The council is comprised of senior technical and policy leaders from across EPA program offices and regions. And here in Region 5, Tara Fong, a member of our senior leadership team, also serves as a member. The council is co-chaired by EPA's Assistant Administrator for Water, Radhika Fox, and EPA's Regional Administrator for Region 1 in New England, David Cash. The council met Administrator Regan's call through the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, which was released in October of 2021. And the roadmap does several things. It includes clear timelines for concrete action through 2024. It fills a critical gap in federal leadership, setting a basic floor of federal protection across the country. It supports states' ongoing efforts to tackle PFAS by building critical science, methods, tools, and technologies. And it builds on EPA's commitment to restore scientific integrity by making science the foundation of our work. I'll return to the specific commitments in our PFAS roadmap in a few minutes. Next slide, please. But before I share more about EPA's PFAS roadmap, I want to spend a few minutes talking about per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or as we have been referring to them, PFAS, and why we are concerned about them. PFAS captures a large group of synthetic chemicals that consist of chains of carbon atoms surrounded by fluorine atoms. There are thousands of different PFAS with a variety of chemical structures. Some of these chemicals have been more widely used and studied than others. As example, as you can see on the left side of my slide here, it shows the chemical structures of two of the most widely used and studied chemicals in the PFAS group known as PFOA and PFOS. I'll be referring to these two compounds, PFOA and PFOS, a little later. PFAS have been used in homes, businesses, and industry since the 1940s. They have been used and are used by many industries and found in many consumer products due to their useful properties, including stain and water resistance and their beneficial role in firefighting foams used to extinguish, extinguish fuel fires. Due to their widespread use, PFAS have been found in soil, water, fish, and air across the country and across the world. Surveys conducted by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention show that most people in the, in the United States have been exposed to PFAS, including measurable levels of certain PFAS in human blood. Most known exposures to PFAS are relatively low, but some can be high, particularly when people are exposed to, a, to concentrated sources over long periods of time. PFAS are a concern to human health due to their known or suspected toxicity. Health effects are better known for some PFAS, such as PFOA and PFOS, but much less well known for others. I'll describe a bit, a bit later some of the work EPA is doing to improve our scientific understanding. And finally, scientific research has shown that PFAS can resist decomposition in the environment and in the human body due to their unique properties. Next slide, please. The life cycle diagram on the left of this slide shows some of the ways in which PFAS are used and can enter the environment. Now, I know that some of the text is small, but the picture does help to illustrate a few major ways PFAS can enter the environment and potentially impact human health. These ways include discharges of PFAS pollution from manufacturing facilities, discharges of PFAS containing firefighting foam, PFAS entering wastewater treatment facilities from upstream sources, 
and PFAS applied to agricultural fields as a component of biosolids. And biosolids are the solid organic material left over from wastewater treatment process. Through these significant and diverse pathways, PFAS contamination presents unique challenges. EPA's approach toward PFAS takes this uniqueness into account and is centered around the following principles. First, EPA is considering the life cycle of PFAS, including their unique properties, the ubiquity of their uses, and the multiple pathways for exposure. Second, EPA is getting upstream of the problem. We're bringing deeper focus to prevent PFAS from entering, entering the environment in the first place, a foundational step to reducing the exposure and potential risk of future PFAS contamination. Third, EPA is holding polluters accountable for their actions and for PFAS remediation efforts. Fourth, EPA is ensuring science-based decision-making. We're investing in scientific research to fill gaps in understanding of PFAS. And fifth, EPA is prioritizing protection of disadvantaged communities. When taking action on PFAS, we're ensuring that disadvantaged communities have equitable access to solutions. And this principle of protecting communities is a critical reason why we are here tonight. Next slide, please. The risk posed by PFAS demand that EPA attack the PFAS problem on multiple fronts at the same time. The actions described in our strategic roadmap each represent important and meaningful steps to safeguard communities from PFAS contamination. And so we believe these actions will build upon one another and lead to more enduring and protective solutions. EPA's integrated approach to PFAS is focused on three goals. First, research. EPA is investing in research, development, and innovation to increase the understanding of PFAS exposures and toxicities, human health and ecological effects, and actions we can take that incorporate the best available science. Second, restrict. EPA is pursuing a comprehensive approach to proactively prevent PFAS from entering air, land, and water at levels that can adversely impact human health and the environment. And third, remediate. EPA is broadening and accelerating the cleanup of PFAS contamination. Restrict, research, remediate. Next slide. So what are some of the key accomplishments? EPA is committed to issuing a, a public report on its progress each year in the roadmap. So last year in November of 2022, we, re we released the first one-year progress report summarizing the critical actions we've taken. Since the roadmap's release in October of 2021, EPA has taken the following actions, which I'll talk about in greater detail later in the presentation. So we've proposed to designate 2PFAS as hazardous substances under CERCLA, also known as Superfund. We've released drinking water health advisories for 4PFAS. We've laid the foundation for enhancing data on PFAS. We've begun distributing $10 billion in funding to address emerging contaminants under the bipartisan infrastructure law. We've expanded the scientific understanding of PFAS and translated the science into EPA's efforts. We've proactively used enforcement tools to better identify and address PFAS releases. We've released a set of PFAS analytic tools to publicly share data on PFAS in communities. And finally, we've engaged with federal partners and the public. EPA's PFAS work was informed by public webinars, stakeholder meetings, congressional testimony, and engagement with EPA's federal advisory committees. We're also coordinating with our federal agency partners in the Biden-Harris administration to harness the collective knowledge, experience, and capacity of federal government to address PFAS. 
In addition to highlighting the actions EPA has taken, our one-year progress re report also identified a series of upcoming priority actions for this year in 2023, such as proposing a national drinking water standard, which we released or which we announced on March 14th, taking final action on the proposed CERCLA designation for PFOA and PFOS, continuing to improve chemical data and safety, restricting upstream PFAS discharges to waterways, addressing PFAS and biosolids, and engaging with communities like we're doing here tonight. I'll cover each of these upcoming actions in a few moments. Next slide, please. So over the next few slides, I'll cover some program specific commitments from various offices here at EPA. As I highlighted earlier, science and research are the foundation of EPA's work on PFAS. EPA is working to improve the scientific understanding of PFAS in three primary areas. First, we're working to develop and validate methods to detect and measure PFAS in the environment. Second, we are working to advance the science to assess human health and environmental risk from PFAS. Our scientists are developing human health toxicity assessments for additional PFAS, they're compiling and summarizing available and relevant scientific information. They're identifying PFAS sources, the ways PFAS moves in the environment, and the pathway by which people can be exposed to PFAS. And they're characterizing how PFAS exposure may contribute to cumulative impacts on communities. And third, we're working to evaluate and develop technologies for reducing PFAS in the environment. This work will inform decisions on drinking water and wastewater treatment, contaminated site cleanup and remediation, air emission controls, and end of life management, end of life materials management. Next slide, please. The next area I'll cover is our work to ensure chemical safety. EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention is working on many actions to restrict PFAS, and most of these actions fall under two laws, the Toxic Substance Control Act, or you may have heard this called TSCA, and the Toxics Release Inventory Program, which you might know as the TRI, which is a Community Right to Know program. First, EPA is working to deepen our understanding of PFAS categories through the National PFAS Testing Strategy, which EPA released in October of 2021. The testing strategy is a major step towards the game-changing goal of breaking PFAS into distinct categories. So instead of looking at PFAS chemical by chemical, they're looking into categories to direct research, amplify regulatory action, and accelerate technology and policy solutions to restrict and remediate PFAS. Second, EPA is working under its TSCA authorities to strengthen EPA oversight over both new and existing PFAS. We're working to ensure a robust review process for new PFAS to ensure that chemicals are safe before they enter commerce. And we're working to review existing PFAS under TSCA to ensure they're being used in ways that do not present concerns and to prevent resumed production of legacy PFAS or their uses in new ways. As example, in early, I'm sorry, in late January, EPA proposed a rule that would ensure that any discontinued use of certain PFAS cannot re-enter the marketplace without EPA review. Third, EPA is, is collecting data and improving reporting on how PFAS are used and released. Under TSCA, we're working on a final rule to better characterize the sources and quantities of manufactured PFAS in the United States. This final rule would collect significant new information on chemical quantities, byproducts, worker exposures, and disposal methods. And under the Toxics Release Inventory, or again, the TRI, 
We are working to enhance PFAS reporting by proposing a rule to remove exemptions and exclusions from reporting. Last December, EPA released a proposed rule to enhance TRI PFAS reporting. If final, this rule would enhance the data availability to the public so EPA and other federal, tribes, states, and local agencies can use these data to help best protect health and the environment. And fourth, EPA is working to reduce the presence of PFAS in products purchased by the federal government. In December of 2021, President Biden signed an executive order that will reestablish the federal government as a leader in sustainability. A critical element of the executive order is to promote sustainable federal purchasing, which includes prioritizing the purchase of products without added PFAS, and EPA has taken a leadership role in this work. Next slide, please. Next, I'll cover our Office of Water, where we are taking an extensive set of actions to restrict PFAS through EPA's programs to protect drinking water and our lakes, rivers, and streams. First, let's take a look at drinking water. On March 14th, as I mentioned earlier, EPA took a key step to protect public health by proposing the first ever national drinking water standard for six PFAS fulfilling a foundational commitment in the PFAS strategic roadmap. Through this proposed rule, EPA is taking a major step to protect public health from PFAS pollution, leveraging the latest science, and complementing state efforts to limit PFAS by proposing to establish legally enforceable levels for six PFAS known to occur in drinking water. The rule is currently open for public comment until May 30th, and you can learn more about the proposed rule and how to access the formal public comment docket on our website at epa.gov forward slash PFAS. We recently held two webinars on the proposed rule and made available the webinar recordings and presentation materials, um, which is also on our website. And we'll be holding a virtual public hearing on the proposed rule on May 4th. And you can learn more about these opportunities, again, at, um, by visiting our website at epa.gov forward slash PFAS. EPA is also working to improve drinking water data through monitoring, toxicity assessments, and health advisories. As example, we're currently taking important steps to monitor drinking water in communities across the country through our fifth Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or also known as the UCMR-5. This program is testing for 29 PFAS chemicals starting this year through 2025 in thousands of drinking water systems nationwide. You may remember that an earlier round of EPA monitoring from 2013 to 2015 helped us discover PFAS contamination and led to significant state and local actions to safeguard our drinking water. With our latest rule, we're taking it a step further. We'll be testing for nearly five times more PFAS at significantly more water systems and using methods that can detect PFAS at much lower levels. These new data will be critical in improving our understanding of how communities, including low income communities and communities of color, may be exposed to PFAS in our drinking water. As I mentioned earlier, in June of 2022, EPA released four health advisories, interim health advisories for PFOA and PFOS, and final health advisories for PFBS and for Gen X, the Gen X chemicals. Under the Clean Water Act, EPA is working to develop national technology-based discharge limits for industries that use PFAS through our Effluent Limitation Guidelines Program. In January of 2023, EPA released its final Effluent Limits Guidelines, Plan 15, which outlines key steps toward addressing PFAS discharges across a range of industrial categories. Also under the Clean Water Act, 
We're working to address PFAS and permitting and through analytical methods, water quality criteria, and fish advisories. We're working to leverage the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, also known as NPDES, wastewater permitting program to improve monitoring and to reduce PFAS discharges to waterways. In December of 2022, EPA released new guidance to states describing how to leverage permits and pretreatment programs to increase monitoring, including at known or suspected dischargers, dischargers of PFAS. This guidance will enable states to take appropriate steps to reduce PFAS at their source, collect important data on PFAS discharges, and enable communities to walk work closely with their state permitting authority to take action where discharges may occur. We're also working on improving analytical methods to measure more PFAS in more places. In April of 2022, EPA released draft aquatic life water quality criteria for public comment for PFOA and PFOS, which reflect the latest peer reviewed scientific knowledge regarding the the effects of these chemicals on freshwater aquatic organisms. We're also working to enhance data availability on PFAS and fish tissue to help states and tribes set, P, set PFAS fish advisories. And finally, as I referenced earlier, we're working to evaluate the risk of PFAS in biosolids. We'll be finalizing a risk assessment for PFOA and PFOS that will serve as the basis for determining whether regulation of these two compounds in biosolids is appropriate. Next slide, please. So this slide covers two of our program offices, our Office of Land and Emergency Management, which houses EPA's clean, cleanup programs, and our Office of Air and Radiation, where our team of experts work to address air pollution. First, I'll talk about a specific action that I highlighted earlier under CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or more commonly known as Superfund. In September of 2022, EPA published a proposed rule to designate PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under Superfund. If finalized, this rule would require facilities across the country to report PFOA and PFOS releases that meet or exceed reportable quantities for these substances. The rule would enhance the ability of federal, tribal nations, state, and local authorities to obtain information regarding the location and extent of releases. If final, the rule would enhance the ability of EPA and other agencies to respond to releases or threats of releases of PFOA and PFOS. And the rule would help establish national consistency in the evaluation and cleanup of, PF of PFOA and PFOS and encourage better waste management practices. As noted in the roadmap, EPA intends to take final action on the proposed rule in 2023, and will continue to work closely with stakeholders to better understand equity concerns. An additional step, last year, or I'm sorry, last week, EPA issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to seek public comment on designating other PFAS chemicals as CERCLA hazardous substances. Next, under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, also known as RICRA, EPA plans to propose two regulations in 2023. First, EPA plans to develop a proposed rule to add specific PFAS to the list of hazardous constituents, which would mean that these PFAS are subject to RICRA corrective action requirements. Second, EPA plans to clarify that emerging contaminants such as PFAS can be cleaned up through the RICRA corrective action process. The third item on this slide highlights EPA's commitment to take significant steps toward updating our research and guidance on PFAS destruction and disposal. 
EPA published interim guidance in December of 2020. In that document, we highlighted specific uncertainties about the effectiveness of some PFAS destruction and disposal technologies. And we have a deadline to update, update that guidance by December of 2023. Finally, our Office of Air and Radiation is also taking steps towards restricting PFAS by building the technical foundation for potential Clean Air Act regulation. We're working to identify sources, to develop monitoring approaches and information on mitigation technologies, and to increase our understanding of the fate and transport of PFAS air emissions. This work will support future decisions on whether to designate PFAS as hazardous air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. Next slide, please. So no conversation about PFAS is complete without highlighting the transformational investments being made in America's water infrastructure through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or bill, signed by President Biden in November of 2021. The bill provides the single largest commitment, investment in clean water that the federal government has ever made. The bill would build on the research restrictions and remediation called for in the PFAS roadmap by providing $10 billion for communities impacted by PFAS and other emerging contaminants. The bill builds on three of EPA's existing water finance programs, but focuses them specifically on PFAS and emerging contaminants. And it provides all 10 billion of these funds without a requirement for state matching funds, and all funds are provided either as grants or principal forgiveness loans. Of the 10 billion, 4 billion will flow through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, 1 billion will flow through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and 5 billion will provide grants to address emerging contaminants in small and disadvantaged communities. In February of 2023, EPA announced the availability of 2 billion from this program to address emerging contaminants, including PFAS and drinking water across the country. These funds will be allocated to states and territories and will promote access to safe and clean water in small, rural, and disadvantaged communities while supporting local economies. EPA is committed to maximizing the impact of these funds in addressing urgent water challenges facing communities. And we'll th we're thrilled that these funds will enable communities to invest in PFAS treatment solutions while EPA continues to take action to research, restrict, and remediate PFAS consistent with our PFAS strategic roadmap. Well, I've covered a lot of information in this presentation tonight and would encourage you to visit our website. And again, that's epa.gov forward slash PFAS. There you can find all of this information and much more on what actions EPA has taken and plans to take on PFAS. The website is continuously updated and will have the latest information related to new rulemaking and other actions. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator, Kirsten, to talk about the next part of our session where we will hear from you. Thanks, Kim. <clears throat> Welcome everyone back. Uh, we're, time, we're in time for the listening session. Um, so we look forward to providing you an opportunity who are interested, um, for those of you rather, who are interested to share your feedback. Um, but before we jump straight to that, I'd like to share just a bit more background information. Um, I wanna emphasize that the feedback you share with us tonight will help inform future actions that EPA takes toward helping communities address this PFAS contamination. Along with this, one important thing to note is that the feedback that you share with us will not be considered as part of the formal public co comment process for any specific action EPA has taken, which is consistent with EPA's PFAS strategic roadmap. If you do have comments on any specific action we are taking, such as a proposed regulation, 
You should provide those comments as part of the formal public comment process. You can learn more about the actions we have taken and plan to take on our website, as Kim mentioned, www.epa.gov slash PFAS. One question you may have is regarding what EPA plans on doing with the feedback you share with us tonight. We do not plan to individually respond to all of the comments that we receive. However, we do plan to take back everything we hear, as well as the feedback we gathered at all of the other regional listen listening sessions we are holding to inform EPA's future work. Now I'd like to turn it back over quickly to Grace at LRG to share some additional details about how the listening session will work. Thank you, Kirsten. We will now be opening this session up for public feedback. First, we'll hear from those individuals who signed up during the registration process. Um, but before we get to those folks, um, a couple of tips on how to share verbal feedback. If you signed up ahead of time, you'll receive a message in Zoom um, that will give you speaking permissions. So please click on that message. When you have speaker permissions, we'll call your name. At that point, you should unmute and begin speaking. You are welcome to turn your video on or keep it off. Please limit your comment to three minutes. And I also wanted to mention that if you have trouble clicking the link or unmuting yourself, you can email us at info at pfascommunityengagement.org and we can uh, try to help resolve your issue. And even if we're unable to help you before we get through the speakers, who have signed up, who's, who signed up during registration. We do expect to have time in this meeting today uh, to open it up for anyone else on the call who would like to provide feedback. Um, so with that, we will begin working on pulling up our first speakers. Uh, so please be patient with us. Uh, sometimes this does takes, this might take a little bit of time for us to get our first uh, speakers situated and, and ready to, um, to speak and so we can hear them. So um, we'll do that now and um, we're looking forward to this discussion. I would like to welcome Laura Ola to provide comment, Laura Ola. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, there, now you can see me. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Laura Ola. I'm a member of the Mole Lake Sakaga and Ojibwa tribe in Wisconsin and acknowledge my great grandmothers today. I'm the executive director of Citizens for Safe Water Around Badger and the national coordinator for the ceasefire campaign. In communities across America and its territories, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy and Industry are permitted by the EPA and authors, authorized states to conduct routine open air burning and open detonation of hazardous waste, causing the uncontrolled daily release of toxic emissions to the environment and permanently polluting our lands and water. These burn pits are not just overseas, they are here at home. In 1990, rural families near the former Badger Army Ammunition Plant here in Wisconsin, including my own family, learned that private drinking water wells with, were contaminated with toxic chemicals that had migrated to groundwater from open burning areas that were more than three miles away. Today, more than 30 years later, the explosive DNT has been detected in groundwater concentrations as high as 1,286,900 nanograms per liter, a concentration that is 25,000 times higher than the Wisconsin groundwater enforcement standard of only 50 nanograms per liter for total DNT. At active bases like the Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center in Indiana, which is also in EPA Region 5, the military is allowed to open burn and detonate as much as 109 million pounds of hazardous waste every year. This practice, contrary to longstanding federal record regulations, has been permitted by EPA for decades. Which brings me to PFAS. Emerging contaminants like PFAS are part of this waste stream 
at crane and other military and industrial open burning open detonation sites. Military countermeasure flares, for example, may contain as much as 45% PFAS. PFAS are intentionally added to improve the performance and stability of military explosives and munitions. Department of Defense has been actively ramping up the production of insensitive and polymer-based explosives, so this threat to public health is only going to escalate. Here in Wisconsin, a defense contractor in Washburn County has had a long-standing license that expressly authorizes them the op to open burn hazardous waste containing PFAS. As EPA is keenly aware, advanced alternative technologies have been successfully deployed by the military and private sector in certain communities, but this devastating practice continues in communities without the resources to defend themselves from this relentless source of toxic exposure and harm. These are our nation's domestic burn pits. They are here at home and they are almost all sited in communities that are the most vulnerable to harm. We do not accept that measuring the toxic smoke that envelops whole neighborhoods will protect human health or the environment, as there is simply no way to burn and detonate hazardous waste, including PFAS, in the open air. A complete and immediate national ban remains the only true and just solution. Thank you for the opportunity to submit our comments today. Thank you very much, Laura. We appreciate it. Mary Matthews, um, you're up next. We're ready for your comment. Mary Matthews. We can't hear you, Mary. You might have to unmute. Okay. Now? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that this is not a major source of PFAS, but um, it is growing and I think it is better to prevent rather than to try to clean up afterwards. My community um, in outside of Chicago is building a 10 acre community park with artificial grass, which is made with PFAS. Um, the city has joined a lawsuit against 3M for its uh, polluting Lake Michigan and our drinking water but the city has decided that it's perfectly okay to pollute the Skokie River with PFAS from the artificial grass. Um, so if the EPA could move a little faster and uh, restrict use of many products, I think you could prevent a lot of uh, pollution that affects a lot of other communities. So I thank you for uh, this presentation and for taking all the steps that you are. And uh, I hope you can move faster. <laughs> I know that's difficult, but I hope you can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. Thanks for being engaged. Okay, next we have Mary Blanchard. Mary Blanchard. Hello? We can hear you. Thank you. My name is Mary Blanchard and I am a member of the Citizen Advisory Work Group under MPART, the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. I want to thank the EPA for standing strong against the influence of corporations, lobbyists, and even some politicians by keeping the proposed PFAS limits as low as possible. Through meetings with MPART and our Citizens Advisory Work Group over two years, I have learned how, how widespread the PFAS chemicals are in our water, air, soil, wildlife, and even our people. Michigan started earlier than many other states in identifying PFAS co contamination, so we may have more sites identified 
But currently, uh, we have 240 identified sites. This is likely not the end of the sites that will be listed. As each meeting, we have more sites uh, listed. Recently, MPART's executive director, Abby Hendershot, stated that every time they look for PFAS, they find it. In our own town of Holly, Michigan, we have an abandoned dump uh, that is uh, discovered to have PFAS after uh, having heavy metals identified in the mid 90s. Our own citizen testing has also revealed that we have um, PFAS and it's outside of the boundaries of this dump. The state of Michigan agencies are still working on determining the full range of contamination. And we have uh, fish in two nearby lakes also identified as having PFAS that will qualify for a fish advisory. I would like to thank the EPA for con Confirming the importance of considering cumulative totals of PFAS present when sampling. Our current levels of PFAS are low compared to other areas around our state, but we have multiple PFAS compounds in many of the sample events that have happened. I ask that the EPA continue to stay strong in passing these propo proposed PFAS limits. I also ask that the EPA and our politicians will realize that PFAS need to be treated as a class and that the United States needs to follow the example of some of our European nations to ban all PFAS from products for the health and safety of our people, our water and our environment now and long into the future. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mary. Thanks so much. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. Next is Jeffrey Lamont. Jeffrey Lamont. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. My name is Jeff Lamont. I'm a founding member of SOH2O, Save Our Water. Uh, I own a home in a very large PFAS contaminated groundwater plume that is over five miles wide that is discharging directly through surface water and groundwater to Lake Michigan. This is from unabated use and testing of AFFF firefighting foams by Johnson Controls and Tyco at their fire training center for almost 60 years. And after they used these foams, they used water to wash them down to the drainage ways that led directly to Lake Michigan. So in our area, we have soil contamination, we have groundwater contamination in the tens of thousands of PPT. We have surface water contamination discharging, as I said, over a five mile wide plume. We also have biosolids that were spread on over 3,500 acres of agricultural land in the county, Marinette County. And these biosolids range from the high tens of thousands to 100,000 parts per trillion. In our area, enforcement has been an issue and Wisconsin has actually just recently sued Johnson Controls and Tyco over this issue. And because of this enforcement problem the state has had, a neighbor and myself petitioned EPA to do a hazard evaluation. The hazard evaluation showed that the site is highly contaminated and the site will move to the next phase and a site evaluation by EPA. This has also been necessitated if Wisconsin has lagged other neighbor states on PFAS regulations and standards from the beginning. As a property owner, and a retired hydrogeologist with over 30 years of experience investigating and remediating as a contractor for EPA Region 5 and other regions and private clients, I applaud your actions and I thank you for allowing me to speak. We appreciate you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Next is Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. That's great. 
So my name is Jim Ryan. I, I work as a vice president of operations for Water Surplus, which is a water treatment uh, company located in Illinois. I've also uh, been in the city management field for over 25 years. So my, my questions are, are this. We, we currently provide both rental temporary treatment for PFAS as well as new, new treatment technologies. And uh, we were the first to deploy PFAS remediation in the state of Wisconsin, uh, being approved by the Wisconsin DNR. So the, the question or comment that I have is when we're looking at these new funding mechanisms through the EPA, um, while it's fantastic and I applaud the EPA and the administration for providing this funding, it does not always meet the timelines, particularly for small communities that uh, might have only two or three wells. And when they have PFAS contamination and need to shut down those wells, you know, they, they can't necessarily wait for the federal funding. So um, we have provided assistance with several communities in the state of Wisconsin and others. Um, so I would encourage you when you're looking at um, these fundings uh, that you're bringing down to the state level that um, there might be an opportunity if you could retroactively um, fund these communities where they're um, you know, essentially paying for this unfunded mandate due to the PFAS contamination, that they could be eligible for federal funding retroactively if it was approved by the state. I think that's critical, uh, particularly for small communities um, that don't have the means uh, or really have the time to wait for the federal funding to trickle down to them. Uh, I think it's going to be a critical issue going forward and if you could provide that retroactivity i think that would be a tremendous help for uh, smaller to mid-sized communities and thank you for uh, having this community engagement session i think it's very important thank you for that feedback randy naprash you are up next randy naprash can you hear me we can Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this session. I am a staff person for the Minnesota City's Stormwater Coalition, MCSC, an organization comprised of about 130 cities regulated under the MS4 Stormwater Permitting Program. We've seen a great deal of activity and materials generated by EPA and other regulatory authorities related to PFAS chemicals, mostly focused on drinking water and wastewater systems. We appreciate that this is a hugely challenging set of, of issues for the agency. We are very concerned though, that the stormwater program issues and concerns are not being sufficiently addressed by EPA. Specifically, we strongly urge EPA to reach out to the stormwater sector to discuss multiple PFAS issues and concerns with us. Please contact me on behalf of MCSC. Please also contact the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance, or NAMSA, for the national perspective. NAMSA represents a national network of more than 4,000 MS4 permittees, and I can help EPA staff make contact with NAMSA. We are especially concerned that stormwater has been glaringly omitted from some EPA actions. For example, on March 14th, 2023, EPA held a listening session on CERCLA enforcement and PFAS. EPA senior staff openly discussed explicitly exempting multiple types of municipal operations from CERCLA enforcement, including drinking water systems, wastewater treatment plants, landfills, airports, and fire departments. Municipally owned and operated stormwater systems were completely left off of this list. This is a serious deficiency. There are more than 7,500 MS4 permittees in the country that are regulated under NPDES permits. This includes every 
large and medium-sized city in the country. These NPDES permits create legally enforceable obligations and liabilities for these permittees in exactly the same ways that they do for wastewater treatment plants. It is simply not acceptable for EPA to leave these thousands of MS4 permittees out of actions like the CERCLA enforcement exemptions. Stormwater system managers have other concerns related to PFAS that they wish to discuss with EPA. To date, MCSC has had no interactions with Region 5 to work on PFAS issues. Please reach out to me and begin the process of engaging the stormwater sector in EPA's work on PFAS. Thank you. I appreciate all the head nodding. <laughs> Thank you very much, Randy. Your input is, is very much appreciated. Okay. It looks like perhaps um, everyone that signed up to give comments may have already given their comments. Um, so thank you all for, for those who did sign up. Um, we do still have some time left, so we can open it up to anyone else who may have comments or wants to give feedback on any of the issues that we discussed today. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Grace to just share a little bit more about how you can provide feedback during this time. Um, so Grace, back to you. Okay, so since we do have some additional, um, some more time in our session today, um, if you would like to give feedback um, and you haven't haven't given feedback yet, please click the raise hand button um, in Zoom. So please keep your hand raised until you've had the opportunity to give your feedback. Unmute when your name or number is called. You may share your video um, if you'd like, or you can keep it off. Um, if you are joining via phone, callers should press star nine on the phone to share a comment. Um, and then please unmute and begin speaking when you hear your telephone number called. So we'll see if we have anyone um, who raises their hand. Um, looks like we might have a few already. Uh, so please, from, from here on out, use the raise hand function to let us know that you would like to provide feedback. And I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you. Um, Arnie LaRiche, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Arnie LaRiche. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, we, we can hear okay. you. My, okay, thank you. My name is Arnie LaRiche, and I currently live in uh, Oscoda, Michigan, which is on the northeast side on Lake Huron. I am going to talk about the public engagement specifically with publicly transparent information uh, about the implementation of uh, CERCLA, more specifically the federal facilities because I live right next to one. I worked for EPA for 38 years and some of it was public engagement uh, work. And when I retired up here, I watched the Air Force and the state agencies try especially the state agencies, to engage the public with information about what was going on. And this was in 2012 through 15. And, but it did not hit the fan until the do not eat the fish, and then a few years later, do not eat the deer that were close to the site. Um, what I'd like to highlight is that for many years, EPA was not allowed to really implement the statutes that were there to prevent these kinds of chemicals from widely being disposed of uh, in the environment. And, but you have, a, I think PA and other agencies have an opportunity to make up for that lost time. And what I would suggest is that CERCLA uh, should trigger it should trigger a review of EPA's oversight implementation of CERCLA, and especially in public oversight of the federal facilities. And that is of both the regional implementation as the oversight agency, 
mostly at the national uh, priority listed uh, sites, but also the state sites. And that oversight should help and gear and be developed in a way that it is assisting the states and the regions to be able to stand up to the wide spectrum of implementation by the Department of Defense at their sites. And many times they're not even following EPA's best practices uh, in their uh, implementation of CERCLA or the defense um, response policies. Uh, I would suggest that there are evaluation and uh, sharing of information uh, programs already in place with EPA and the roadmap includes this area of engaging the public and sharing information about what's happening with PFAS, where it is located, what is the status of the the, the uh, mitigation and, and remediation at these sites. And what was published a few months ago was the PFAS analytical tool uh, that is a public website and sharing of that information is very important, especially for EJ sites. There is a lot, there are a lot of um, ways that policies need to be changed. The national priority listing uh, should be revised so that there's an equal opportunity for sites that are NPLs, but ones that are not. And so they can get either a TAG grant or a TAP grant to help the uh, communities. Um, the program that I'm talking about on evaluation is currently in place. It's called the State Review Framework. I've discussed this with the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Environment and DOD, Mr. Kidd. I'm hoping that they will start to listen of ways that they can self-evaluate and report their information to EPA's database that uh, that website will handle. And I'll just stop at, at that. And thank you very much for the work that EPA has been doing, especially the last two years. Thank you, Arnie, appreciate it. Um, Don, Don Jensen is next. Good evening, uh, my, my name is Don Jensen. I manage a water uh, plant in, uh, in Illinois in Highland Park, serve about 60,000 people, Lake Michigan source. And I just wanna give you a little bit of perspective from a uh, water treatment professional perspective. Um, the, the PFAS and PFOS uh, classic chemicals. I, I recently saw Argonne Lab was doing a, an analysis of, of uh, potential health risks uh, several years ago, the Chicago Water Week presentation. And they were looking at 8,000 some uh, substances. So my anxiety is we're looking at the tip of a very large iceberg with the six uh, that are being regulated or proposed to be regulated in drinking water. So th I have a lot of anxiety about that. Um, also, the, the uh, the detection limits, I'm expecting those as, as your earlier speaker mentioned to, to go down. Uh, we presently have not detected it and the sampling that we've done uh, at our Lake Michigan facility, our neighbors have up and down the lake. So it's, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, so that, that's another anxiety. And the other, another thing that, uh, that we worry about is the technology to treat this in, in uh, at the municipal drinking water level, particularly at, at larger, you know, that the gentleman earlier mentioned wells in Wisconsin, uh, that's relatively small compared to the larger communities that use surface water. So the cost of, of retrofitting these plants is that the 10 billion is a drop in the bucket. Um, if you do that nationwide, it's gonna be many, many times that. Uh, I, I, I don't even have an idea what it might cost for our plant to do that. Um, the, the reference to excluding water wastewater from circle enforcement is really good news because we don't have any choice. We, we take the water as it, as it comes to us, as do the wastewater guys and, and all those flush toilets and whatever goes down, they've got to deal with it. And one last point, the, um, the health advisory, the part per quadrillion lifetime exposure health advisory, uh, I, I feel like EPA got a little bit ahead of themselves. Uh, all this research that you're doing 
is important to, uh, to establish, of course, health advisory. What can we do as an industry to, to reduce the exposure of our population? Um, but in the meantime, we've, uh, we, by issuing these health advisories, you've raised a lot of concern among the public. Um, I've been hearing from residents and elected officials, and we don't have any good answers for them at this point. So I, I think you kind of got ahead of, of, of us, you're ahead of yourselves uh, with, with, uh, with that. And the fact, I, I'm a little confused as to what our exposures as a population are. I know it's in Scotchgard and, and a lot of consumer products, and I don't know how that fits into the exposure as far as a percentage uh, for drinking water. So that, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Um, next, we have John. I'm not sure of last name, just John, you're up next. Hey, can you see and hear me okay? We can. Thank you. All right. First of all, Deborah, congratulations. I think the president made a wonderful choice in Region 5. Uh, so we appreciate you and, and glad to see you. Uh, as a former mayor, I just want to make a few points. Now, first of all, you already know the importance of working with local communities, and I thank you for that. And I hope you will continue to do it. We have been touring the state of Wisconsin and meeting with uh, communities on a regional basis, finding out that they are obviously nervous about it. So the more relationship that we have with our local communities, the better. So I, I thank you for that effort. And those communications from you and the communications in tandem with the state of Wisconsin and the five regional states is going to be imperative as we move forward. So please continue that. It makes the local uh, units feel better and helps them to work more collaboratively the more they know and the less they're surprised, as you know, and you have done a great job at that. Uh, I do ask you to please keep the information on the um, funding opportunities and methodology um, open to and communicating on a consistent basis with the folks, uh, not only just the water departments uh, in the municipal levels, but, but the elected officials, if at all possible, because uh, I think everyone is trying to work in tandem on this to make this work uh, very well. We're all looking towards mitigation, but a lot of people in Wisconsin are even afraid to test, as I think you found out in other areas around the, the uh, region of five and around the country. But lastly, I will just say that um, as you look at funding opportunities, please think about some of the communities like we've had in Wausau, where they really got caught and it was a very difficult time for them. They needed to get immediate um, opportunities for RAS systems or GAC systems in right away. Um, and they were having difficulty with uh, some of the issues regarding bidding where they knew they could get products early. If there's any opportunity to allow for funding for immediate um, uh, placement of uh, products and services that can get them to that point where their, their constituents and their residents feel a little bit more safer about drinking the water uh, through a GAC system, whatever you're gonna use, that would be great for uh, folks to have that opportunity. Um, those are just a couple of ideas from the local level and from the state of Wisconsin and, and us here in Racine. So God bless you guys. Thank you for everything that you do from the bottom of our hearts. We say thank you. And Deborah, I hope to see you again real soon. Thank you, John. As a community involvement coordinator, I'm very happy to, to hear that you appreciate our work. Thank you. Sure do. Stacy Lurch, you're up next. I, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Stacy Lurch. Hey, thanks so much. Say, I'm a, a family physician. I live 10 minutes from the state capitol, and I just learned this week that um, at, least, at least two people on my street have drinking water that isn't safe for consumption. And I... Um, really appreciate all the very intelligent articulate comments made by others and I'm just like starting to learn about all of this and so I could really wanted to echo like um, the importance of like user-friendly information because I have no idea what to do next as a family physician um so, and I, I do know from like a Facebook group um, for my neighborhood that several other people have also have hazardous levels, but I'm not really sure 
what the next step is. Um, I know that like these reports apparently aren't made available to the um, Department of Health for Dane County nor the DNR unless you release it, which um, I didn't find out until like months after I had tested. So I that was new to me. Um, I don't know how many others like how how aware um, other people are about that. So I think that's important to share. It sounds like maybe that'll change over time for this presentation, but I'm wondering if the panel wouldn't mind addressing like next steps for people who are more basic about this information like I am, like reverse osmosis versus filtration versus whole house filtration, or should I be like <clears throat> getting together with all the neighbors to figure out how many people tested positively for hazardous levels? And then um, also, is there any funding? It was several hundred dollars for the testing. I know not everyone can, can uh, afford that. If there are any thoughts on that? Thanks so much. Thank you, Stacey. Appreciate it. You can, um, we have your information. Uh, you know, we have your name and obviously you've signed up for this. So we'll get back to you directly, okay? We'll reach out. I, I can commit to you that. Is there anyone else we're waiting on? Okay, looks like we got through all of our hand raises. Um, is there anyone else on the line that, that is interested in providing comment? Please feel free to raise your hand now. Give it a couple moments just so people can consider it. Randy, welcome back. Randy, we can't hear you. If you wanna see if you're unmuted. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that I had been called on. Um, thank you for the chance to talk again. I just wanted to offer a quick piece of information, uh, both for EPA, but also the other public officials that are on the call. Um, I recently received a copy of a draft letter being prepared by a number of organizations in the water sector across the board to a Senate committee um, seeking legislative action to create liability protection for public um, entities that are what's called passive receivers for PFAS. So uh, entities like wastewater treatment plants, drinking water, also stormwater, haven't, we haven't really created the materials, but it's, they are in our systems, we are discharging them, we are passive receivers of the PFAS. Um, so there is action underway that folks may want to be aware of uh, to try to seek statutory liability protection for public entities. Um, the other comment I wanted to make though was this letter was really interesting to me because it completely replicated almost line by line the omission that had occurred during the CERCLA enforcement a webinar from EPA. So they were addressing um, drinking water, wastewater, landfills, airports, fire departments. And this letter completely omitted the publicly owned and operated stormwater systems. So it just gives me another set of people now that I have to chase down uh, to raise stormwater concerns again. But such is life in the stormwater sector. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Just double checking, anyone else out there?
looks like we potentially have someone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, just wanted to say thank you all so much for uh, putting this on on behalf of Congresswoman Dingle. And um, we are looking forward to seeing some, if not all of you, uh, in the upcoming uh, meeting, uh, I believe in Romulus. So we're tracking a lot of those issues uh, there, but really glad for this informational session and also appreciative of the constituents who have made their way here. Thanks, Cal. All right, team. Well, I think we are ready to wrap up. Um, just want to double check here. Yep, it looks like we're good. So thank you all for sharing your feedback with us. Um, quickly before we close, I'd like to turn it back to Kim to share a few of the major themes we have heard from you tonight. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. And most importantly, thank you all for sharing your feedback with us tonight. So first of all, I wanted to, I, I appreciate the fact that we heard speakers from Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and that we had individuals registered to attend tonight's session from all six of our Region 5 states and from tribes in Region 5. We heard appreciation for the work EPA is doing under the PFAS strategic roadmap and an encouragement for EPA to move faster. We heard concerns about incineration associated with military bases and military waste, and specifically how PFAS can be present in these waste streams. We heard encouragement for EPA to take a more active role in overseeing PFAS cleanup at military sites or military bases and the importance of being transparent with PFAS data. We heard concerns about PFAS and artificial turf and potential impacts to nearby waterways, as well as PFAS concerns in fish. We heard about the widespread nature of PFAS contamination and how we continue to discover additional contamination as our Region 5 states conduct additional sampling. We heard about the importance of holding manufacturers and polluters accountable for contamination, including contamination to our waterways and the Great Lakes. We heard encouragement for EPA to reach out and more directly address PFAS in stormwater. We heard concerns about the ability of communities to fund PFAS treatment technology, especially communities who have already needed to install these technologies and concerns of how these technologies can effectively address the entire class of PFAS chemicals. And we heard encouragement to continue to work closely with communities, especially around how to clearly communicate the risk of PFAS exposure to the public and what actions communities and families can take. So thank you all again. And now I'll turn it back over to Kristen to close out tonight. Thanks, Kim. So following today's session, know that you may continue to share input after the event via email to pfoscouncil at epa.gov. That's P-F-A-S-C-O-U-N-C-I-L at epa.gov. Again, please be aware that the feedback you shared with us um, orally or via email tonight will not be considered as part of the formal public comment process for any specific action EPA is taking under the roadmap. You can find more information on EPA's efforts on PFAS at EPA's website, www.epa.gov PFAS. On that site, you can find links to each of the major actions EPA is taking under the PFAS roadmap and where appropriate, links to the formal comment opportunities for each action through an online docket. As stated previously, we don't plan to individually respond to the comments we received this evening, but we do plan to synthesize what we've learned from each of our regional sessions in which there are 10, as well as from our April 6th session for tribes to inform EPA's future work on PFAS. 
With that, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight and a special thanks to each of you who shared feedback with us. I'd also like to thank Regional Administrator Deborah Shore, Rod Snyder from EPA's PFAS Council, and my Region 5 colleague, Kim Harris, for joining us as well. Thank you everyone again and have a great night.